All right, welcome everyone. This is our webinar on authors' rights. My name is Tim Valente, and I'm scholarly communications librarian. And I'm joined by my colleague, Georgia Westbrook, who's our OER and instruction librarian. We're both at the Midtown location of the Toro College Libraries. So our agenda for this uh, webinar on authors' rights, first, we're gonna have an overview of copyright. Uh, we're gonna talk about what are authors' rights, uh, what agreements do you sign when publishing? What are routes to open access? We'll talk a little bit about open access, specifically green open access, and the steps you can take to deposit your work in Toro Scholar, which is our institutional repository. I just want to start with a disclaimer that the content in this presentation is not legal advice, nor are the presenters legal counsel to any party. Um, and this presentation is for informational purposes only. So you should consult legal counsel whenever you're making important legal decisions. Copyright comes from Title 17 of the US Code and protects creators of, quote, original works of authorship. Um, while copyright is singular, it's actually a set of exclusive rights, including the right to reproduce work in copies, the right to create derivative works like adapting a book into a play, the right to distribute copies or transfer ownership of a work, the right to perform the work publicly, the right to display the work publicly, and a very niche thing is um, if it's a sound recording, the right to perform the work publicly via digital audio transmission. The copyright applies to creative work and to scholarly works, and it's distinct from other intellectual property protections like patents and trademarks. And why do we need copyright? The core idea of copyright is to protect creators. The US Constitution says that copyright exists, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Copyright protection begins as soon as a work is fixed in a tangible form. So neither publication nor copyright registration are required, but you can't for example, copyright a dream you had last night until you write it down. For works created in 1978 or after, the copyright for individually authored works lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years. Copyright for jointly authored works lasts for the life of the last surviving author plus seven years. And works for hire, anonymous works and pseudonymous, pseudonymous works are protected by copyright for 95 years after publication or 120 years after the creation, whichever comes first. And these lengths were chosen so that creators and their heirs can seek reasonable profit for their work while also ensuring that eventually the work will join other creative works that artists can build upon and update to create new artistic works. So they're joining the public domain eventually. Copyright can be renewed for a second term of protection, but if it's not, the work enters the public domain. And the Stanford University Libraries explain that the public domain is, quote, made up of um, creative materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws, such as copyright, trademark, or patent laws. So the public owns these works, not an individual author or artist. Anyone can use a public domain work without obtaining permission, but no one can ever own it. Um, Tim is going to handle most of the stuff about author's rights, but I just want to introduce it quickly. So when you're publishing your research in a scholarly journal, you will likely need to sign a contract with the publisher outlining who will control the copyrights. In some cases, the publisher may want to take all of your rights, while in true open access journals, they may only ask for the right to publish your article first. So author's rights are exactly what they sound like, the rights authors have, particularly as they relate to working with publishers and platforms to disseminate their work, and they are really valuable. Copyright and how it's applied is determined by the law, the federal code I mentioned, and by the contract you sign with the publisher. And with that contract, you have a lot of options. You can keep, split, share, or give up your copyrights. You can play with the licensing. And Tim will talk about um, kind of how that might work a bit later in the presentation. Um, and one type of licensing to be aware of is Creative Commons licensing. Creative Commons licensing is like copyright's best friend, or at least a really close friend. It's a set of licenses that support more free use and adaptation of public works because they're modular and emphasize adaptation and reuse. 
So for this reason, they're commonly used to license open educational resources, and that's where we're really seeing them a lot in the library space. Um, you can combine permissions, as I said, because they're modular, to create a license that works best for your content. And this chart shows how Creative Commons sits in between public domain and copyright in terms of usage. So you can use it without permission under certain circumstances, and creators are setting the rules, not the U.S. Code. Um, and I just wanted to show you what the licenses look like briefly um, and go over what they mean so that you can recognize them when you see them. But we're always able to assist you at the libraries with deciphering the symbols. And the Creative Commons website, which is just creativecommons.org, is also a really valuable resource. So the little person, as it says, is attribution. That means you need to give credit to the creator when you use the material. And that's always, always there when you're using a Creative Commons license because that attribution is a super important um, element of Creative Commons. The equal sign means no derivatives. So if you see that you can use it for free, um, but you can't edit it. Um, that loopy arrow means share alike, which means you should apply the same license that was on the original work, and so should any subsequent users and editors. And the money sign with the slash means you cannot use um, you cannot sell the material or use it for another commercial purpose, so you can't profit from it in any way. Um, and you can see from this image that they can be used in any combination, and you'll often see them in that little gray box, which comes right from Creative Commons um, and it's on like the title page um, or the cover of a resource. And with that, I'll pass it off to Tim. Great, thanks, Georgia. So Georgia mentioned the contractual limitations to copyright. That's where you're, you're signing an agreement and you give away certain rights or all of your exclusive rights under copyright. For many years, the de facto arrangement between authors and publishers was that in order for an author's work to be published, the author needed to transfer all of their rights to the publisher. So if this were standard practice uh, and it continues to this day, then you might wonder what the downsides are. And essentially, you give away control of your work for the duration of the work's copyright. And this means you would likely have to ask permission for the publisher from the publisher, who is now the rights holder, to share the work either personally or widely, like on a website, to reuse the work for your own research and a variety of other uses. Conversely, the publisher then uh, would not need to ask for your permission to republish the work. So your work might end up in a collection uh, with other papers. So the bottom line is uh, you give away control for the duration of your work's copyright when you transfer all of your exclusive rights. So what are these copyright transfer agreements, also called author agreements or journal publishing agreements, look like? Here we have excerpts from agreements from two different publishers. What you'll notice is that both contracts transfer copyright from the creator to the publisher. So on the left, you can clearly read, I transfer copyright ownership. Uh, and on the right, it reads, I hereby grant sole and exclusive right and license. What you'll also notice that uh, the agreement on the left grants the author back permission to deposit the accepted manuscript in an open access repository. So in this case, it's PubMed Central, um, if that research uh, were funded by the NIH. This is to satisfy the NIH public access policy, but it is uh, illustrative of how these contracts can be flexible, um, where the publisher only asks for certain rights to be transferred or licensed, or the publisher grants permission back to you, the author, for the uses you need, such as depositing it in an open access repository. These are just two examples. There are uh, many others, and they vary widely. They also vary in their public accessibility. Typically, they'll be sent to you after you submitted your paper uh, for publication as an agreement that you fill out and sign and then send back to the publisher. So one method of ensuring you retain your rights as an author or creator and you retain the rights that are important for you is to attach an addendum to your publishing contract. Spark, together with Creative Commons, developed an author addendum and an addendum creating tool, which you might use. The important po uh, points to note are that author agreements are often negotiable, that you should scrutinize the author agreements, and that you can have a dialogue with the publisher before simply signing away all your rights. Another tip is that you can contact your colleagues or uh, research support staff, including library staff, to investigate journals and to take a look at the journal's author agreement, see exactly what it's saying. 
Ultimately, a balanced approach to publishing uh, respects authors, creators, and publishers. As an author, you should retain the rights you want and need. Using and developing your work without restriction is probably at the top of your mind, but you might also consider increased access and impact of your work. So when you deposit in one of those open access repositories like Toro Scholar, which I'll cover shortly, you can ensure that scholars in the global public have access to your work so your ideas can be spread and your work can be cited more. Publishers need certain rights to publish your work, but these need not always be exclusive. Uh, publishers also require attribution so that the work they facilitated in publishing your paper gets proper credit. And the Creative Commons licenses that Georgia outlined make this very easy to achieve uh, proper attribution. So uh, this week is Open Access Week, and we, we could and we have devoted entire webinars to the topic of open access, uh, but I just want to briefly go over some of the, the key concepts as it relates especially to authors' rights. So uh, Spark defines open access as the, quote, the free immediate online availability of research articles coupled with the rights to use these articles fully in the digital environment. So here on this slide are listed the main types of open access publishing methods. We have gold open access, which is preferred by publishers and currently is the dominant route to open access. And this is when authors or their institutions pay a fee to the publisher who then makes the article freely and immediately available, usually with a CC BY license. That's the Creative Commons attribution license at the top of the chart Georgia showed you. There are other routes to open access. So some publishers, especially nonprofit society publishers, are able to operate without having to charge authors to publish or readers to subscribe to their content. And this model is called diamond or platinum open access. Some publishers will make their papers only free to read and not openly license the work. And this is referred to as bronze open access. Lastly, journals which contain both closed access and closed access meaning you need to subscribe to the journal to be able to, to read the articles or pay for the papers. So journals that have these closed access articles and contain open access content are referred to as hybrid journals. So what do all these colors ultimately mean? They reflect the evolving scholarly publishing landscape and they're important to be aware of when selecting a journal and eventually when you're reviewing the author agreement, which will go over uh, the licensing of the, the content you're submitting to the publisher. So here are two examples of publisher pages which highlight the different types of open access. On the left is the Public Library of Sciences Open Access Journal Biology, and PLOS uh, has all the articles published with a Creative Commons license via gold open access. Uh, on the right, it's a little harder to see, uh, but this is a hybrid journal from Elsevier. The journal's title is Antiviral Research. Uh, it's volume 182. And you can see that first highlighted box, it's a, a open access article, which is probably gold open access, so there's probably a fee involved. And then the second uh, highlighted area, that would be considered bronze open access. So Elsevier labels it as full text access. So you could read the paper, but there's no open license applied to it. And then lastly, you'll see uh, a closed access article. It says purchase PDF. So this is one that's not freely available. Uh, it's not free to read and doesn't have an open license. You have to subscribe to the journal or a package of journals or pay for the paper in order to read it. So it's a lot of, uh, it's a variety of open access methods or routes to open access. The last one that we finally arrived to is green open access. This route to open access enables authors to make a copy of their work available through an institutional or subject repository, sometimes only after an embargo period, which it can be six to 12 months or any uh, set time determined by the publisher. Toro Scholar is the uh, institutional repository of the Toro College and University system, and it's maintained by the libraries. So Toro Scholar contains content of our affiliated authors, faculty, staff, and students. And it's important to note that self-archiving is usually allowed for a version of your work called the author accepted manuscript, although there's a few other uh, ways publishers define at which stage you could uh, publish a copy of your work, at which stage of the work you could uh, deposit a copy, rather. 
Um, but it, what's really important to note is it's not the publisher's final PDF, which is the final typeset document or version of record. That's something that would be on the publisher's website. Most publishers don't allow you to self-archive that, uh, but some do. And then, um, so Sherpa Romeo from JISC, which is a, a UK-based nonprofit, they have this tool which allows us to look up the publisher's policies. Uh, and, you know, you could use the tool as well to see what the policies of a prospective publisher, a prospective journal is before you're publishing in it. So how do I deposit in Toro Scholar? How do I uh, achieve open access for my article via green open access? And it says easy as emailing toro.scholar at toro.edu. And we will handle pretty much everything. So we will investigate the publisher policies. We could even request permission from publishers when it's appropriate. And we will ensure that the correct version of your article is posted. So you just go to Toro Scholar, our website. Uh, you could check it out. And as I said, email toro.scholar at toro.edu. Uh, you could also reach out to me directly. Uh, my contact is at the end of the presentation. So importantly, why deposit? Um, so we talked briefly about this, but uh, having an open access version or an open access uh, article, it opens your work to a world of readers and scholars. So not just those scholars or readers who have access to material through an institution. This increases your readers, which could increase your citations. Um, another reason to deposit is it's preserving your work. So while publishers, especially commercial publishers, um, they do preserve your work, multiple copies of it, uh, especially in a digital form. Um, some of the smaller publishers, that's not always the case or it's not always clear. So you know that when you're depositing that you're trusting your work to the libraries and to the, your institution to be preserved. And um, you could also see how others are using your work and interacting in it, with it. So via our uh, PlumX snapshot, which I have a screenshot at the bottom, um, you could see uh, the usage, citations, captures, mentions, social media posts about uh, your work. And that gives you a more comprehensive look at who's reading what I wrote. You also see our readership map for the whole repository with download counts. And uh, the repository continues to grow as more authors deposit and as more authors are also publishing open access. So thank you. I have the contact information here for, uh, again, for Toro Scholar and also for uh, the libraries where you could ask any question as it relates to scholarly publishing, but of course, any other question you might have, our library staff is happy to answer. And um, I have both our emails at the bottom. And um, if there are any questions, we could take those now. And I'm just gonna check the chat. Great, so we have a question to clarify uh, what is meant by no clear license for the bronze level. Uh, so no clear open license um, would be bronze open access. And it's sort of a newer term that's coined. Um, and it's meaning that uh, publishers are allowing you to, to read the work. So if we go back to the example, oops of uh, full text access, All right? If I clicked on that article, I would be able to read the article, but when I see if there's a license applied to it, it's just gonna say copyright the publisher. And that means that all the additional uh, benefits of an open license are unavailable to me. Uh, so certain reuse, um, yeah, republishing, et cetera, um, which, um, you know, limits you as, uh, an author now, but it also limits future authors and readers in the future, because to do any of the things that are not covered by uh, a contract or the statute, uh, statutes of copyright law, right, you would have to ask the, the, the rights holder for permission. So part of Creative Commons is that perpetual access, which is made clear through uh, a clear licensing statement. And another question, uh, I wrote an article with co-authors. Do I need their permission to put the work in Toro Scholar? So we encourage you to reach out to co-authors to make sure you're on the same page. 
Uh, but if the work was created by two or more authors with the intention to merge the contributions into a single work, then that would constitute a joint work. Uh, and so each author of a joint work can exercise all of their exclusive rights. So bottom line is you wouldn't need the permission of co-authors if, if it's a joint work, uh, but we're always happy to, to investigate the particulars of a particular situation if it comes up. And uh, one last question, I guess. Um, what if I cannot find my accepted manuscript? And so, uh, you know, you should search your computers, any accounts you have, email, um, search for messages from the publisher. So try to find that accepted manuscript. And uh, you might find something and you're not sure if it's the right version, right? If it's an accepted manuscript or if it's the publisher PDF, let's say. So you could simply email us uh, to confirm this. And you could also contact the publisher directly and ask them for the accepted manuscript. Or, you know, a lot of publishers use a submission system, so you may be able to log in there and download whatever you uh, uploaded into that system. And there's another question. Um, a lot of collections that were previously behind paywalls have been made temporarily, temporarily available during the quarantine. How might this be possible for a copyright agreement? Yeah, so... Um, the publishers, right, in a, in a traditional um, publishing contract where you transfer all rights to the publisher, um, they're the rights holder for that work. So they decide what happens to that work, where it gets published, etc. So they can grant temporary access um, just by posting it and making it available for reading, which is what's happening for a lot of the COVID-19 research. Not all of that um, research, right, is being posted with a clear and open license. So uh, the problem with that is uh, you might have access now, but that doesn't mean that you'll have access when the publishers decide to sort of turn off the spigot. Um, also, you know, you download a copy of that work. Um, it's still not openly licensed, so you're restricted in how you could share it and build on it. So while it's, it's good that uh, publishers are making more of their content available, you have to be, take it with a grain of salt and realize that uh, they're not openly licensing it and they're not giving permission in the same way that uh, Creative Commons licensing gives permission to a broader public. So it's really sort of a, a temporary uh, uh, benefit that's being offered. Thank you for these great questions. Um, if there are any other questions that come up, uh, please send us an email. Um, again, our contact is at the uh, end of these slides, and we'll be posting this recording um, for your future use.